And thanks very much for, uh, for inviting me and for all the wonderful speakers before really uh, doing my job for me. Um, I'm going to talk about atypical HUS today. Uh, we'll discuss briefly the genetics triggering stimuli and the role of complement in secondary TMAs. I was principally asked to discuss the recent registry data that's come out, the presentation, the treatment, the, uh, and the outcomes, and how you go about referring people. So why is Newcastle interested in complement and atypical HOS? And it comes from this incredibly large pedigree and two others, where 20 years ago now, we were able to undertake genetic analysis, which showed linkage to the uh, RCA cluster in chromosome 1, which uh, houses lots of the genes for the alternate pathway of complement. Now, the alternate pathway of complement is triggered by both the classical pathway, by antibody activation, by the lectin pathway, which is triggered by bacterial sugars, and is always on. And as Kate said, it's an amplification loop where C3B binds to factor B, cleaved by factor D to give you C3BBB, and that continues to cleave C3. So rapidly, you get upregulation, and unchecked, you get the anaphylatoxin C3A, C5A, the opsin in C3B, and the membrane attack complex. It's evolved to kill bugs. However, it's not very good for your kidney. And because of that, you have complement regulatory proteins. And these five proteins here are all you need to know about complement in atypical HUS. The ones on the left, factor H, factor I, and MCP are the regulators of the complement system, the break. And C3 and factor B are the actual components that upregulate. And what happens is factor I is the enzyme, MCP, factor H is the cofactor. And they will come in and they will cleave C3B to the inactive IC3B, stopping that amplification loop. And to cut a long story short, we now know that there are inherited defects in atypical HOS, the, the loss of function regulate, uh, in mutations in the regulator of factor H, factor I and CD46, with factor H being by far the commonest, and gain of function mutations in C3 and factor B. We also have acquired defects uh, with autoantibodies to factor H. So either you get decreased regulation by mutations or autoantibodies, or increased activation by gain-of-function mutations. Now, this provided the rationale for the use of the clozumab. Um, now, as it's been said, clozumab doesn't actually stop that amplification that acts downstream to bind to C5 and stops inflammation and cell lysis. Now, although I've said this is a genetic disease, it's not a genetic disease like say, cystic fibrosis, where if you get the mutation, you get disease. Uh, this is all HUS, all people with factor H mutations or factor I mutations. And what you can see is it can occur throughout life. I think our oldest patient with a factor H mutation presented about 83. For this talk, however, you can see this kind of peak in the childbearing ages. And that is, unsurprisingly, pregnancy associated. So you require more than just the genetic mutation. You also require a trigger, and you also require some other modifier genes, which we won't necessarily go into today. Now, I think we'll step, take a step back, and if you look at the literature, it's all over the place when it comes to what we actually call things. There are multiple classifications. We've had multiple today, and you can classify it in many different ways. However, some people classify atypical HUS as anything that's not typical HUS, which means it's not STEC and it's not Adams TS13. However, with the advent of Clozumab, what people are classifying, calling HUS, may be complement-mediated HUS. So you need to be careful when you read the literature on this to see what people are actually talking about. So you have the primary TMAs, TTPs, and HUSs with mutations inherited or acquired. And then you have these secondary cases here and your infection associated. And I have said sometimes you need a trigger. And sometimes it can be difficult to know if these infections are triggers of atypical HUS or indeed like pneumococcal where it's a direct mechanism. Now, that's important because 
when we talk about the role of eclosumab in atypical HUS, the initial seminal trials really focused on the people with complement mutations, autoantibodies, or where you can, couldn't find anything else. However, there are plenty of other causes of secondary TMAs, one of which is pregnancy associated. And things like infection, you get complement activation. That is what happens when you get an infection, you activate complement. But whether this is causative, a modifier, or a bystander effect is yet unclear. And one of the things we looked at was whether pregnancy-associated HUS had the same complement mutations as typical, atypical HUS. Now, why is that important? Well, eclosumab is incredibly expensive, and not everybody responds. There are currently at least three mutation types where you present with a TMA where people do not respond to eclosumab. And what do I mean by non-responder? That means that you keep on hemolyzing despite eclosumab. That's not a late presenter where you may not recover renal function, but you will stop hemolyzing. So there are non-complement causes of HUS or TMAs, and there are also polymorphisms where eclosumab uh, won't uh, bind to C5. Um, that C5 there, that's a variant very common in the Japanese population. We look for it routinely when you send a sample in, so we know people will respond, but very rare in the UK population. So NHS England fund eclosumab through the NRCTC. However, the eligibility criteria really matched the clinical trial, and the problem with the clinical trial was pregnancy was excluded. So what we did uh, with the European uh, units was to try and generate evidence for eclosumab in pregnancy. So the UK, Italy and the French came together. The Spanish were slightly later, which was why there are two different papers. And in the larger group, there were about 550 patients that presented uh, women, uh, sorry, there were 550 patients uh, in childbearing years that presented in the last 30 years, and of them, 16% were pregnancy associated. The Spanish cohorts, roughly the same, that's all patients, not just women of childbearing years, so you get a similar sort of uh, percentage there, and that's about 16% or in females of childbearing years will present with HUS during pregnancy. Mean age, about 29, similar for the Spanish group. About half had had a pregnancy before. Uh, in the larger group, about 10% had preeclampsia in the run-up. There have been studies looking at preeclampsia, and essentially the mutations that are reported aren't functionally significant. Fetal loss is really quite common in pregnancy. Uh, if you've had, if you develop HUS later, you have a family history. Clearly, these are people with family history of HUS. That's quite common. And if you've had HUS before, you're likely to develop it again during pregnancy. When do you develop it? Well, there was a story that second pregnancy was the commonest time to develop it, that, but that doesn't seem to be the case. But half of HUS will occur during the first pregnancy and half in a subsequent pregnancy. When does it occur? Kate's already said that most of it occurs postpartum, about 75%. And of those that aren't postpartum, 75% uh, are again in the third trimester. So presentation. Unsurprisingly, they are anemic from the cytopenic and have acute renal failure. Dialysis at presentation is really quite common. About 71% uh, will require dialysis. Extra renal manifestations, really, really pretty infrequent, and I wouldn't even class pulmonary edema as an extra renal manifestation for us. There has been talk about low platelet counts and low creatinine being a marker of um, exclusion for um, atypical HUS and cause it and a marker for TTP, but you can see here it's pretty poor. You're going to miss lots of people 
um, with a typical HUS if you take those markers, which is critical for getting the Adams TS 13 and it's pleasing that we can now get it really quickly, seven days a week all around the country. The um, treatment, most people, uh, uh, certainly in the UK, Italian and French groups, had plasma exchange. That's the time period the clozumab was just coming out. The Spanish group, um, for, far more people had a clozumab, but they all had it second line. Uh, only 5% in the Italian, French and UK group. Um, there were various other therapies, but the vast majority of people in this time frame were having plasma exchange. Um, Follow-up, again, the outcome is pretty poor. Uh, End-stage renal failure, about 50%. Spanish group's better, but again, this is due to clozumab. Um, the difference between end-stage renal failure and initial presentation is less marked, and this probably reflects um, a late presentation rather than uh, any differences between the cohorts. Uh, again, the Spanish group had much better outcome because more were treated with seclusimab with about 50% having normal renal function. Deaths were pretty much unheard of, but neonatal deaths were not unheard of. Treatment. So if you look at outcome by treatment, what you find is plasma exchange seems to make absolutely no difference. Now that is after once um, Adam's TS13 has been excluded. So plasma exchange, if you had it or if you didn't, half um, developed end-stage renal failure and 20% developed chronic renal failure regardless of what you did. Uh, that is in the Tri-Nation study. And in that, only three patients re received eclizumab promptly and uh, all of them recovered. There was one that started very late and was probably a late presenter and... Um, didn't recover renal function, but did stop hemolyzing. Uh, Spanish group, in this, far more people treated with seclusimab. Everybody treated with seclusimab recovered. Those that didn't get seclusimab, uh, there was about a 50% end stage renal failure rate. So, complement mutations, well, they're pretty common. 60% in France, UK, slightly less common in France and Italy. Although it's very common at the moment, this is falling now. You've got to remember this is retrospective, and now we're getting lots of cases that don't necessarily have um, a typical HUS, so we're screening far more patients so that mutation rates are going on. This essentially is your ascertainment cohort, in much the same way that the other registry data is. And what you can see is that this complement mutation exactly parallels what you see in other causes of atypical HUS. Predominantly factor H mutations in both studies, factor I, CD46, C3, and combined mutations. So really, one of the highest proportion of mutations you see in atypical HUS. If you characterize um, outcome by mutation status, what you see is if you've got complement mutation, you're far more likely to need dialysis, you're far more likely to relapse, and you're far more likely to go to end stage. If you try and subtype it, there aren't really enough to go by mutation rates. It's, pre it's pretty much the same with no uh, statistical significance. If you look at it, whether it was during pregnancy or whether it was postpartum, the only thing that really differs uh, between the groups is uh, the personal history of HUS. If you had HUS before, you were far more likely to develop HUS during pregnancy. So, pregnancy-associated HUS is pretty severe. About 40 to 70 percent will require dialysis. Uh, in the pre-occlusimab era, about 50 percent reached end-stage renal failure. Uh, most pregnancy-associated HUS will occur postpartum. And of those uh, during pregnancy, most of them occur in the third trimester. Complement genetic changes are present in more than 50%. This is exactly the same as what you see in other atypical HUS. And what's happening is that pregnancy is the key trigger of HUS in this sort of setting. You don't see much weight, uh, difference uh, in presentation uh, time whether you have a 
complement mutation or not. 50% will be in the first pregnancy, uh, and the remaining will be spread over up even to the first presentation being in the fourth pregnancy. You're, if you've got a complement gene mutation, you have a worse outcome, you're more likely to progress, and you're more likely to relapse, and there's no difference by mutation type that we can tease out at the moment. Plasma exchange does not improve outcome, um, and end-stage renal failure uh, occurred in about 30% with or without plasma exchange. Um, Eclusimab of the 14 patients treated, uh, 13 responded, and the other was likely a late presenter. And we will now uh, treat with eclusimab first line, uh, if we think it's a complement mediated AHOS, provided we've got an ADAMS TS13. This is a key test uh, for us to be able to uh, treat. So despite the lack of pregnancy associated H HUS patients in the clinical trials, NHS England are accepting this registry data and will allow us to treat, which isn't the case for lots of the other secondary causes of AHOS. And finally, to say, if you do think you've got a case, uh, there's always a consultant on call. If you go to the webpage at atypicalhus.co.uk, uh, you'll get all the referral information and some clinical information and the phone numbers there. Uh, just give us a ring and uh, we can expedite sample collection and eclusimab treatment. Thanks very much.